acquired autoimmune disorder. It is caused by antibody-mediated T-cell-dependent complement-mediated attack on the postsynaptic membrane. So now if it is an autoimmune disease disorder and why do we say that it's a typical autoimmune dis disorder it's because the uh, myasthenia i mean the antibody that is responsible for causation of myasthenia has been recognized it is acetylcholine receptor antibodies and uh, it had been possible to produce the models by injecting this acetylcholine choline receptor and sort of by passive transfer of antibodies to animals and to develop the models that develop clinical features of myasthenia gravis and also it had been possible to actively immunize people with uh, the receptors and then the, the antibodies that were developed were passively transferred to animal and again to develop the clinical models of myasthenia gravis and also further and it had been possible or have been able to clearly confirm or to control the, all the symptoms of myasthenia gravis with the usual immunosuppressant agents that we use in our day-to-day -day clinical practice so based on these it had been uh, very clearly uh, uh, it had been uh, easily and clearly been able to demonstrate all the features of an autoimmune disease in cases of models that have been developed on myasthenia gravis. So if we consider the uh, neuromuscular junction, we all know that it's a disease of the neuromuscular junction when an impulse is generated or transferred and there is an, I mean this is the normal transmission that I'm trying to recapitulate, then there is an action potential generated in the presynaptic nerve terminal with which that there is influx of calcium which uh, influences the release of the acetylcholine from the acetylcholine vesicles by exercise ptosis to the uh, neuromuscular junction. This acetylcholine reacts with this protein receptor, acetylcholine receptor, and generates depo or action potential or depolarization with which that there is, uh, uh, there is voltage gated sodium channel. Uh, opening up and there is depolarization uh, with which that the uh, there is an action potential that's generated in the skeletal muscles which induces contraction of the muscle so that is how it the in a normal person uh, uh, neuromuscular junction functions but in case of uh, uh, myasthenia gravis there is antibody formation against these acetylcholines. In a normal person, the, uh, this acetylcholine that is released is immediately removed. By, it, it is broken down by acetylcholine esterase, which is complexed with this collagen Q molecule on the musk antibodies, musk receptors. So it is with that this acetylcholine is immediately removed. And there are some other antibodies also that are important, uh, that there are some other receptors that are important, that important, that is really, I mean, this, the nerve terminal generated agrin, uh, when it is released, it acts on this receptor called LRP4 receptor. This is lipoprotein uh, related receptor protein peptide, low density lipoprotein related receptor protein 4. So that receptor and then along with that with the musk receptor they keep these acetylcholine receptors concentrated in the neuromuscular junction so it is a fairly complex uh, mechanism and basically in myasthenia gravis they have been able to they have been able to show demonstrate antibodies against i mean in 85 percent of patients there is acetylcholine receptor antibodies and in the rest that is the seronegative people there is in 40 percent there is the antibodies against these mass receptors and then another uh, uh, in uh, five to ten percent are with this lrp4 antibody uh, receptor uh, antibodies and then there are some more antibodies that have been uh, um, uh, found out uh, the, the uh, cotactin uh, antibodies and for the 5 to 10 percent of patients so basically what we mean is that if you have diagnosed a patient with myasthenia gravis there are many antibodies that are responsible predominantly is its acetylcholine receptor antibodies and mass antibodies 
and in others who become negative it does not mean that it is not known but the antibody has not been detected it is an antibody mediated mechanism that function in causation of myasthenia gravis and also i said that this is the eyes influence of thymus on causation or the antibody production is a t cell dependent process and this and it has been shown particularly the young myasthenics they are more likely to have thymoma in about 15% of generalized myasthenia gravis patients they have thymoma and they are generally the young and they have most severe disease and also they always have higher acetylcholine receptor and antihistamines antibody titers and in another uh, 65% of patients if, if they do not have thymoma at least they have thymic hyperplasia demonstrating the relevance of thymoma in causation of myasthenia gravis then if we could move on to second point the myasthenia gravis is a disease of skeletal muscles now i should do that it is the acetylcholine receptors that are antibodies against such acetylcholine receptors that are responsible those are they are only in skeletal muscles so it does not affect your smooth muscles it does not affect your cardiac muscles but it's the skeletal muscles imagine where you have skeletal muscles they all may get affected and it is part of sensory or autonomic manifestations i mean before you treat start commencement of treatment they are not with autonomic manifestations but with treatment you would see that some of them they may develop autonomic manifestations but it is related to treatment but uh, it is uh, not related to disease per se so if we could move on to the clinical features you have two pkgs in young people it's predominantly in male uh, uh, females and in elderly after 60 or so it is predominantly seen in males and they develop i mean in 80% of them they develop ocular manifestations they could present either with double vision or with ptosis or difficulty in closing eyes and then in some of them when their bulbar muscles are affected they could develop difficulty in swallowing or speech disturbance this atria or dysphonia and then limb muscles predominantly the proximal pelvic girdle or the shoulder girdle the person with shoulder girdle will have difficulty in lifting the hands up whereas the person with pelvic girdle would find difficult to climb up steps or getting up from chair and then in another the worst is that they are in about 15% of them their respiratory muscles may get affected so the and the characteristic feature is any of these muscles i mean any of these muscles when you start functioning they become fatigued generally you know that skeletal muscles do not become fatigued but in case of myasthenia gravis you would see that they with the repeated use the muscles become fatigued so that the person with ptosis as you are watching if you ask the person to keep on, on looking up you would see that drooping of the eyelid and at the same time the person who has valve involvement as they are watching if the per- person is talking you would see that the voice tend to fade and the person with pelvic big muscle involvement i mean if you ask person to climb up steps he may be able to be, uh, climb few initial steps but then as he climbs up further you would see that he finds difficult to climb and then based on that they are they are weakness or the symptoms worse become worse towards evening and the in patients who present with ocular manifestations as the disease progresses particularly within the first two years in majority of them about 80% of them the disease end up as generalized disease so i'm trying to show you with pictures i'm trying to get this muscle relaxed first by asking the patient to keep the eyes closed and then when you ask the patient to open eye you see that the person is with ptosis as you keep on watching the second uh, third uh, photograph and fourth photograph you would see that worsening of ptosis and then has difficulty in swallowing difficulty in climbing up steps and the worst is the respiratory failure and there are a few interesting signs that have been described by scientists and one is this frontalis sign that we are i mean so you see that again series of photographs showing the worsening of ptosis but in every where you see that there is the wrinkling elevation of the eyebrows with wrinkling of forehead 
to maintain eyes open that's frontalis sign and then another sign interesting sign that has been described from asthenia gravis is that in normal you have ptosis but if you try to open this eye forcibly there is a worsening of ptosis and then if you try to open this eye first forcibly then again you see that there is worsening of ptosis and then the, some of them, their neck extensors could become worse, uh, weak, and the neck might start falling. And in others, they might find difficult to keep the mouth closed, so that automatically jaw opens, so that you have to maintain a finger underneath the chin to keep the mouth closed. And then, say, if you try to blow the mouth, then it would become difficult because that you have weakness of vaccinator muscles. Then we have this uh, 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 description of ocular versus generalized myasthenia. Initially, we thought that, I mean, ocular myasthenia, uh, ocular symptoms are there in 80% of patients and majority become generalized as the disease progresses. But if symptoms persisted confined to eyes more than two years or so, that we described them as ocular myasthenia. But now, as with the uh, development of the science and technology, as we maintain, manage almost all the symptoms of these patients with myasthenia, I mean, the clinically, it, it has become very indistinct with the availability of highly effective treatment. As you see, eye signs to control them. So you do not know that whether they would become generalized or not. Then with regard to classification for anything, you have a classification. Previous classification is Osaman classification, that is to categorize the severity of illness. But now we have this Mastina Gravis Foundation of America clinical classification uh, on which that I do not want to go into detail uh, as the time does not permit. If we move on to the third point is that this weakness is variable. I told you that there is fluctuation of symptoms with repeated use so that there is variable weakness of myasthenia that lead to the misdiagnosis of psychogenic weakness. So you need to see that, I mean, these patients, sometimes they get up from chair and on another occasion, they might not be able to get up from chair. Sometimes they climb the steps and on another occasion, they find difficult. So, and, and particularly more often you come across a young female who is behaving like that, so that you tend to think that it is psychogenic. And uh, I think you need to be extremely careful to not to miss it because it is a life threatening condition. As with any other diseases, there are the conditions that you have to think of as differential diagnosis. Out of them, if I could take you the ones that you in day-to-day -day clinical practice come across more often, the bulba amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is the one that uh, tend to get confused, but then you know that in ALS, eye involvement is very rare, and then it is in serious onset, steadily deteriorated, steadily progressing type of an illness. There is no regression of symptoms uh, in ALS at any stage there's no fluctuation and then if you check for in ALS you see that the tongue wasting as well as wasting of the other affected muscles as well. Exaggerated reflexes are seen in ALS but then in case of myasthenia also you may see exaggerated reflexes. Another is brainstem ischemia. When you are with brainstem ischemia, you come across a patient who is with dysarthria, and that's another place that you need to be careful. And AIDP is predominantly a sensor, um, motor disease, but if someone complains of I had numbness at the initial stage, then you know that it's unlikely to be myasthenia gravis. If someone says I have pain, pain in hands and legs and with weakness, then it's unlikely to be myasthenia gravis. And Miller Fisher, oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. And another important entity that you tend to confuse with is chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. In case of chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, those are mitochondrial disorders that are with very insidious onset, very slowly progressive. If you ask the person to bring a photograph, that has been done about 10 years ago, you would see that very early clinical features are the torosis and external ophthalmoplegia. And they have bilateral involvement, they have a, a symmetrical involvement, and there is no double vision either. And you could diagnose it with muscle biopsy and with DNA studies. And 
as it's an autoimmune condition there are many other autoimmune conditions that could be associated with myasthenia gravis you need to be vigilant to see that you do not miss those associated autoimmune conditions the patient more more often you see that they are with could be with hyperthyroidism so it's worthy you check in thyroid functions routinely and the rheumatoid arthritis sla and the uh, diabetes is another common association and vitiligo all these uh, i have seen in my clinical practice as associated conditions uh, in patients with myasthenia gravis now once you have clinically diagnosed the patient the there are tests that for you to confirm diagnosis the tests that are available uh, are ice pack idrophonium chloride test neurophysiology and serology they are useful for confirmation of the diagnosis uh, with variable specificity and sensitivity so the ice pack is fairly uh, a sensitive type of a test that you could do as a bedside test you just need to keep a ice pack and i keep I get the patient to close the eye Right? and then you keep the ice pack for 5 minutes and you see uh, observe for an improvement of ptosis and uh, in idrophonium chloride test tensilon test it was a very, very useful test for all of us in our clinical practice and uh, uh, we would be talking in my next slide how you do it then with regard to neurophysiology there are two forms of neurophysiological tests that you could do one is repetitive nerve stimulation where you may see that more than 10% of the 10% uh, uh, more than 10% decrement of the compound muscle action potential with 2 to 5 hertz stimulation and single fiber emg is a sort of a special uh, technique that is uh, i mean sort of it with high very high sensitivity it needs expertise and the experience uh then uh, this the in case of tensilon test i mean it is a sh very short acting acetylcholine esterase inhibitor that you are using so that you inhibit acetylcholine esterase and you let the acetylcholine to be accumulated in that neuromuscular junction so before you do the test you need to select the muscle that is affected and then you give the acetyl the vial carries the tensilon or idrophonium chloride 10 mg so you just do you were 10 test 10 2 mg of test dose initially and the uh, these drugs are with side effects they may cause bradycardia uh, fasciculations tearing uh, so that i mean worse of bradycardia you know that is a cardiac arrest so it's best that you you keep uh, atropine while ready if you are doing a troponin chloride test and we all the time used to do it as an involved procedure within the presence of others because uh, Uh, as the way that my teacher dr jb peris used to say that if you have if you had one cardiac arrest for your career that would be more than enough for you for a idrophonium chloride test i mean fortunately or unfortunately now the idrophonium chloride test is not idrophonium chloride or as uh, idrophonium tensilon is not been manufactured so that it's not available for most of us i mean uh, uh, in our clinical practice so we have to depend on neurophysiological studies ice pack and the uh, uh, serological studies so here you give the tensilon and then as you are giving i mean say you need not give 10 mg but by the time you give 3 mil, uh, 6 mg also you see that the patient starts opening the eye and then the mouth also becomes better and here this is how it would appear in case of repetitive nerve stimulation there is a decrement in case of myasthenia where and there as a normal person there is no uh, decrement in the compound muscle action potential then with regard to serologic uh, studies and the most important is the acetylcholine receptor binding antibodies it is highly specific and generally it does not give much false positives except i mean it's not it may it is present in 80% of myasthenia or a generalized myasthenia 50% of pure myasthenia and if you see acetylcholine receptor positive in without the symptoms of myasthenia gravis then you need to look for a thymoma it could be present in 99% of patients with thymomas then another antibody that could be useful is the antihistamine 
antibodies that again is a marker of presence of thymoma but uh, it's of little significance in isolation then as i told you previously in zero negative patients you could check for mast antibodies and mast disease is with some atypical clinical features and that uh, i'll be having one slide on it and then uh, and there are some other antibodies as i told you that is not widely available those are lrp4 antibodies and cotactin antibodies titin and pyridine antibodies now here uh, it's in case of mast myasthenia generally they may have some atypical atypical features the person generally is likely to become a young woman and they are more likely to have facial bulba neck or respiratory muscle weakness and along with that they could have uh, wasting as well i mean so that you could get confused with the uh, uh, motor neuron disease and uh, they are with a sort of a rapid deterioration and could end up with respiratory failure frequent respiratory failure and they have fever ocular symptoms and signs and may have muscle atrophy and then the, if we could know on to our next pearl is that myasthenia gravis could effectively be treated with immunosuppression with corticosteroids acetaprine and mycophenolate mafetil just like in case of the previous uh, uh, presentation on gillan barre syndrome many treatment modalities that we use i mean gillan barre also was an autoimmune condition and many treatment modalities that were used in gillan barre syndrome could be used in myasthenia gravis as well but generally unless in case of cidp in aidp the long term immunosuppressive treatment is not uh, uh, is not uh, recommended in your uh, general clinical practice uh, whereas in case of myasthenia gravis uh, they need long term immunosuppression i mean you need to treat them for symptoms and at the same time along with that you have to start them on this is modified treatment and the immunosuppressants have to be commenced as dmt and they should be given long term to keep symptoms under control so the initially for symptomatic management you could give anticholinesterase inhibitors and then there are some recommendations with regard to immunization because that you use immunosuppressants you know that Uh, uh inactivated live inac uh, uh, inactivated virus uh, uh, vaccines that carry uh, at an uh, live attenuated virus cannot be used or have to be used with uh, 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 care and uh, whereas the recombinant vaccines are safe so many vaccines that are among uh, us are like measles uh, uh, polio and many other vaccines are live attenuated vaccines so uh, one has to be careful the uh, then with regard to this is modifying treatment you could use immunomodulation uh, the, there are indications for you, to, you for you to use plasma exchange ivig and the mono, monoclonal antibody eclizumab and then there are immunosuppressants uh, that you could use steroids out of other immunosuppressants more often we use either acetaprine or mmf but just keep in mind that there are others as well like cyclosporine and uh, tacrolimus and then there is a place for thymectomy in the management of myasthenia gravis so with regard to pyridostigmine it gives to you a symptomatic relief for about another 4 6 hours but then more often it does not give a complete uh, remission or complete control of symptoms either so the before the introduction of immunosuppression when you give pyridostigmine because that your the recovery is partial you tend to in continue to increase pyridostigmine until they end up with cholinergic crisis so during that period in 1940s to 1970s the many patients develop in addition to myasthenic crisis some develop cholinergic crisis as well so we actually in early stages of our career we were taught how to differentiate cholinergic and myasthenic crisis that we do not use in present day context because we do not need to use pyridostigmine to that extent as we have uh, uh, drugs that could easily control the symptoms of patients with myasthenia gravis so the the you need to time the symptom uh, dose based on the disability say patient needs to eat that you need to give the tablets before the 
before uh, swallowing, before the meal, and for uh, if the patient is with dip diplopia, better to concentrate your dosing, dosing in daytime and so on. And they have this other side effects of uh, the acetylcholine, anticholine, stress related side effects such as the abdominal cramps, diarrhea, and excessive uh, lacrimation. Then most of these patients, I mean, I told you that pyridostigmine would give you a symptomatic release, but then as the disease modifying treatments in a majority, along with pyridostigmine, you have to commence them on steroids. The steroid that we use is prednisolone, and if it's ocular myasthenia, you could give up to about 20 milligrams. Whereas for generalized myasthenia, it's better to start on a lower dose and to build up the dose because that there are reports of worsening of symptoms if you give a loading dose of or high dose of prednisolone all at once. And then you have to keep them on that higher dose for about two to three months and then gradually taper the dose over about six months. And if the patient, if you see that relapsing of clinical features, then have to combine it with a Acetyl, uh, uh, another immunosuppressant such as acetylprene or immunosuppressive agent. You could initially reduce the dose to every other dose, day dose, and then you need to continue that dose for about one, two years and premature tapering the dose. More often, let the patients to re develop relapses and you would see that you easily control those symptoms, but it is at a huge cost of the side effects related to immunosuppressive agents. And then the acetylprene the, is the other immunosuppressive agent that is there that we could use. It's the uh, uh, st steroid sparing uh, as a, uh, the immunosuppressive agent. It's two to three milligrams per kg per day that you could use. And there are side effects like the liver function, uh, the altered hepatitis and the uh, malosuppression uh, for which that you need to monitor patients. So it's important that you train junior doctors if you are using these uh, drugs that are with serious side effects because if otherwise the drugs per se may cause more harm to patients. The other immunosuppressive agent that we use is mycophenolate marfitil. Then the other point is the IV immunoglobulin plasma exchange and assisted ventilation are used for management of crisis situations. The, uh, so if you take IV immunoglobulin or plasma exchange, I'm not going to go into details of it because the previous speaker highlighted, but they both are equally effective. They give you rapid response so that it is indicated in crisis situations, which particularly if patient has severe acute exacerbation, pre-operative period, if you want to send the patient for surgery or for refractory diseases, and then you decide based on, I mean, say uh, uh, the patient, Factors as well as the other uh, external factors such as the cost and availability and where the patient uh, is and so on uh, so that you could decide if otherwise they both are equally effective. Then for patients who are with the refractory disease, we have now, I mean, two monoclonal antibodies that has been recommended, rituximab and eculizumab. The rituximab, uh, uh, they both could be given for to induce remission for patients with severe and refractory generalized myasthenia gravis. They all have the similar side effects such as the hepatitis B reactivation, infections and progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. But the rituximab generally is recommended, uh, is more effective in mass positive patients, whereas eculizumab is recommended for acetylcholine receptor antibody patients. Then the, with regard to thymectomy, the benefits of thymectomy was known for more than 100 years ago but the, uh, they all were based on case series until in recently the results of a re uh, study was released, a single blind study where they compared prednisolone versus prednisolone and thymectomy for acetylcholine receptor positive generalized myasthenia gravis and it clearly showed that the patients who had thymectomy had a better clinical course and lesser relapses and lesser uh, 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 side effects related 
to immunosuppressant agents. So there is a dilemma when we should offer patients the thymectomies because that you continue when you control with immunosuppressive agents, you control symptoms and the need for thymectomy does not arise. But as it is, it appears that if you consider thymectomy in early enough, I mean the patient could enjoy the benefits of that thymectomy without uh, uh, sacrificing to or without uh, 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 going through the undue risks of related to immunosuppressive agents. So it is recommended for patients who are with acetylcholine receptor body positive and for people between generally 18 to 50, people more than 60 years, the thymus is atrophied and for generalized myasthenia gravis patients as well as uh, for patients with thymoma. It's not indicated for old people. The point eight is myasthenic crisis could be precipitated by some medications, surgery, infections, pregnancy, and stress. So you need to be aware the drugs that we could use on patients with myasthenia gravis if otherwise many of them, they uh, uh, develop exacerbations and get into relapses because of our uh, uh, lack of knowledge with regard to drugs that we could use in these patients. Generally, aminoglycoside, fluoroquinolone, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, botulinum toxin, neuromuscular blockers, they all could bring on symptoms and the stresses and infections also could bring on symptoms uh, in patients with myasthenia gravis. The point nine is uh, one has to give special consideration to women in childbearing age and pregnant women. So in pregnancy, generally they may get exacerbations, particularly in the first trimester and the postnatal period. 20 to 30 percent of women can experience exacerbations and therefore what is recommended is a planned pregnancy. You could uh, safely, I mean you could use pyridostigmine, IV, IVT, plasma exchange and prednisolone safe on these patients but you should avoid MMF which is known to cause fetal malformations. What is recommended is assisted delivery and epidural anesthesia. Non-depolarizing muscle relaxation should be avoided. For lactation, the uh, can, it is uh, 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 contraindicated. The MMF, as I told you, is contraindicated. Methotrexate is contraindicated. Acetylprin and cyclosporine, you could continue. Uh, continuation can be considered and others anyway you could use and rituximab, rituximab is not recommended. So point 10 is mortality of myasthenia gravis is remarkably low with the availability of mechanical ventilation and intensive care for myasthenic crisis and the increased options available for immunomodulation therapy. So in myasthenia was recognized in around 18th century and in the early part of 20th century they introduced thymectomy and then the iron lung and then assisted ventilation in 1950s and immunosuppression was introduced to myasthenia gravis in 1971. And since then there were many immunosuppressive agents and now we are with monoclonal antibodies. So with this introduction of all sorts of treatment, in including the treatment that is given for control of infections, we have been able to control myasthenia to great extent. Nowadays, if you could, see, if you see a person who is in respiratory failure with myasthenia gravis, more often one has to assume either patient, either patient has defaulted or that the patient has been mismanaged. So its mortality is very low and they are with good prognosis. So the 10 pearls again, myasthenia gravis is caused by antibody mediated, T cell dependent, complement mediated, postsynaptic membrane defect. The myasthenia gravis is a disease of skeletal muscles and it is paired of sensory or autonomic manifestations. Variable weakness of myasthenia gravis lead to misdiagnosis with psychogenic weakness. Ice pack, hydrophonium chloride test, neurophysiology, serology are useful for confirmation of the diagnosis. Myasthenia gravis could effectively be treated with immunosuppression with corticosteroids, acetylprine, mycophenolate, mofetil, immunoglobulin, plasma exchange and assisted ventilation are used for management of crisis situations. Thymectomy is proven to improve clinical outcome in patients with myasthenia gravis. Myasthenic crisis could be precipitated by some medications. 
special consideration should be given to women in childbearing age and pregnant women. Mortality in mass of myasthenia gravis is remarkably low with the availability of mechanical ventilation and intensive care for myasthenic crisis and the increased options available for immunomodulation therapy.